Hello, and welcome to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. This show is presented to you by Gaslowitz Frankel, a law firm dedicated to resolving disputes involving your wealth, whether it be through your will, your trust, your business, or your investment. For news, pictures, and tips, follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute. Our show's hashtag is Wealth Matters. Your hosts today are Adam Gaslowitz and Craig Frankel, and we're discussing estate planning issues and high-end divorces. As always, we want to share an update with you on the charitable giving program and the celebration of our 25th anniversary year. Recently, we supported Senior Connections, a nonprofit organization in Atlanta that provides meals and home-based care for seniors, also offering health classes, therapeutic leisure activities, and companionship opportunities, serving 4,000 seniors in Atlanta annually. Go to Pinterest.com slash Estate Dispute and follow us for updates on our donations. And now it's time to introduce our three guests. Uh, first, we have uh, Randy Kessler, who's the founding partner of Kessler and Solomiani. Uh, second, we have Larry Fryman, founding partner of Menden and Fryman. And third, we have jo George O'Brien, managing director of Family Financial Management, LLC. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, just giving you each an opportunity to uh, briefly uh, give an overview of who you are and what your company does. So why don't we start with you, Randy? Um, I'm a divorce lawyer in downtown Atlanta. We have 13 lawyers. I uh, I've been doing this for about 26 years. I enjoy it. I enjoy the camaraderie. I, it's funny to say you enjoy practicing divorce law, but I really do. There's no immediate gratification, no high fives. That was a great divorce, but you see people years later know you were there with them when. I've been very active in the uh, Atlanta bar, the Georgia bar, and the American bar, um, heading the family law sections of each of those. And I uh, recently wrote a book, Divorce, Protect Yourself, Your Kids, and Your Future, which uh, feels really good to get it out of me, you know? <laughs> yep. Larry? Good morning. Larry Fryman. Uh, I am a um, uh, founding partner of Menden Fryman. As you said, our practice focuses on uh, business and estate planning. Uh, we've got seven lawyers, and uh, I've been practicing for 20 years. Yeah. Georgia? Georgia O'Brien with Family Financial Management. We advise individual executors and trustees on their day-to-day -day duties and help them with their accountings. All right. All right, let's uh, jump into the first question we've got for you guys, which is what kind of estate planning do you generally recommend as part of divorce settlement? Just sort of the, a, an overview picture. I recommend they call you. <laughs> <laughs> and that will be a constant theme of my answers today because really, you know, we get questions all the time. How do you asset protect in the event of divorce? And the real question is when do they come to us? You know, if they come to us years before they want a divorce, there's a lot we can do. And we can work in partnership with all you guys, with Larry and with uh, all, all of you all, to help them come up with a better will, a better uh, trust environment. And, um, and how often do people pre-plan their divorce years in advance? More and more often. It's actually, you know, I have people that come in for a yearly check-in. <laughs> you know? um, but sometimes it's about custody. I want to be a, a more involved dad. I want to have custody. And I know it's hard for dads to get custody, so we do a check-in. But, um, you know, really, all I can do is explain what would happen if you get a divorce now, given your circumstances. And I can't say go cheat your wife out of money, go cheat your husband out of money. But I can say it's better if more money is in the kid's name. That's sort of a universal theme. The more money we can dedicate and allocate to children through your alls, I mean, that's, you know, Larry will set, up, set it up so that it's harder to extract the money. And, um, and I'm sure he'll talk a lot more about that. But I want to advise them, if they've got money that's in their children's names, very rarely will a court take money away from children to give it to warring parents. So that's sort of the big overarching uh, bit of advice that I would give. I guess I'd just jump in and say in the context of the divorce, the estate planning that should be done is really kind of just a reset of uh, some estate planning that might have been done already. Um, Re-look at wills and uh, trusts that are able to be modified uh, with the, uh, the change in life um, and um, potentially have to look at uh, some things that can't be uh, easily modified to see if there's any, any, uh, any way to bail out and make some changes uh, in, in those circumstances too. Some things are easy to do, like uh, changing beneficiary designations on life sure. insurance or 401k plans and things like that. Well, and some things you can't do once a divorce has started, you know. So, I mean, again, we're all advisors. We all try to tell people what would happen if they got a divorce, if they were in court. And of course, in most courts, once you file, you can't really change the status quo dramatically. You can't go ahead and take somebody out of a will once the case is pending. So. Is there, it, a, is there a restriction on that? There is. There are standing orders that say you cannot do stuff except in the ordinary course of business. If there's some extraordinary need, somebody's in a coma and you've got to appoint a guardian, you know, but except for circumstances like that, you can't really go and change your will and take somebody out of it. So if you're going to go through divorce, 
you, re you really should work on your will and your trust and all that well before anything is filed and not the day before. Because if I was a judge and I saw somebody do that the day before, I would say, you're doing that to try to, you know, take advantage. And, and maybe you're allowed to, but it just doesn't feel right. And divorce courts are courts of equity, you know, which gives the judge a lot of discretion to undo things, say that was a fraudulent transfer or use some legal, what a judge that I know calls lawyer technology, <laughs> and, uh, and undo, you know, the best of intentions or the best of planning. Larry, do you ever see people who come to you and say, I'm thinking about getting a divorce, but before I do that, I want to change my will? I do, and uh, most of the time when that happens, it's a uh, situation where I've represented both the husband and the wife, and um, I need to cut it pretty short pretty quickly because that that presents a conflict for me uh, to, to be involved there. But um, when they're not prior clients, uh, certainly that does come up, thinking about a divorce and, and want to uh, change the will. And I want to go back to something you said because it's a, a point that I think your listeners um, shouldn't uh, lose sight of, which is changing some of the easier things like changing beneficiaries in the context of a divorce, certainly after a divorce. That's really critical and uh, often overlooked and there's plenty of any case law out, out there where um, uh, an ex is the beneficiary on some type of account or uh, life insurance policy and um, notwithstanding a divorce decree that says uh, that the, uh, the the ex is not entitled to that, the beneficiary designation will control that. So uh, there's some... Uh, and, uh, and certain designations are going to be controlled by federal law, ERISA law, some will be controlled by state law. Talk about accounts though when you start a divorce. We see a lot of standing orders in place and, and because of what we deal with when we see the disputes after the fact. Somebody dies or becomes incapacitated during the pendency of the divorce and yet you've got a designation that doesn't do very well or a beneficiary or a title issue that you can't fix because of the standing order. Are you seeing early on in divorce, Randy, for example, where you might say, okay, we've got these five accounts, we're not going to freeze them all, but we'll agree up front, let's treat them and as joint tenants or 50-50 or for the time being, or the same thing on an ERISA where you would need uh, spousal approval. Oh, sure. So you're talking about two people in the middle of a nasty, ugly divorce saying, let's go ahead and agree on a temporary <laughs> resolution. <laughs> the answer is no. Yeah, so the answer, the answer is, practically speaking, no. Logically speaking, rationally speaking, that would be the perfect thing to do. You know, the problem is nobody wants to get along. And, and in, in a divorce situation, you got to figure out how to protect them from themselves despite the fact that they've got an adversary that may not even want the divorce. You know, so you got to get the other side to come to the table, not just to be reasonable, but to accept the fact that the divorce is going to happen and then figure out how to deal with it as a business transaction. Once you have two rational people that both understand it's going to happen, sure. And hopefully when there's a lot of money, people are used to having advisors that advise them and they accept that advice. But sometimes somebody's been out of the loop and they don't trust anything the other one or their advisors say. And that's a really hard position to be in. You know, it's really hard because, you know, ex when you're drafting a will, the idea is completely opposite than when you're drafting a prenup. I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later, but you know, the idea of a will is you want to, if you die, hopefully you still love your spouse and you want them to get everything when you die. And if you divorce, you want the exact opposite. So, <laughs> you know, will and prenup are, are very different ideas. So uh, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of issues there and it's, um, it, it's hard to advise somebody on doing the right thing by your spouse when you're in the middle of a divorce. Because you said you can't change the estate plan. There's usually a standing order uh, beforehand. Can you change beneficiary designations, or is that included in the uh, standing order? You know, I think if you have good intentions, if you're trying to do the right thing by the children, and that's sort of you're out. If it's going to help the children, ultimately the judge is not going to be upset with it. It's so, so if you change to from, from my spouse to my children, that's going to I don't think a judge is going to be upset with it. The, the question is, is it in the ordinary course of business? Is it something you might have done anyway? And it's sort of like Larry said, you know, you're just revisiting estate planning that probably should have been done anyway. And, um, you know, that is a really easy out. What judge is going to say, oh, you get you left a million dollars to your children, I'm going to undo that. You know, the children are the only innocent people in the situation. It, it's amazing the amount of folks that uh, don't pay attention to their beneficiary designations or don't have contingents behind their primary on their beneficiary designations. And my guess would be that during a divorce that, you know, you're not going to get spousal consent on any retirement plans to, uh, to change your beneficiary. I think that's one of the challenges that you were talking about, that, that it's hard enough to get them to the table to 
make this business decision to separate. What, what about adding uh, a designation? On, on ERISA plans and 401k plans and other types of plans, many people forget to go beyond the spouse. And it's just put there and then you go to the default provisions. Yet when you're getting a divorce, you now have tax issues, you wanted to go to your kids, you wanted to go to your estate, you want to do something. Can you make those changes and have the addition, not taking the spouse off, which you can't do without spousal approval, but saying what happens in the event that the spouse isn't there? Can you do that? See, you just made yourself a lot of money because any time a divorce lawyer <laughs> hears the word ERISA, <laughs> we start to shake. You know, because it, there's so many nuances and so many details that all we know is before you change anything, talk to an expert, talk to one of these guys, talk to, to whether it's George or Larry or Craig, or, I mean, somebody that's gone through the litigation of this and understands how it plays out. I, I, the true answer is I don't know, and I'm not gonna tell anybody to change anything. Talk to the experts in that area, and uh, maybe Larry yeah, can handle I think, that. Yeah, well, I think in, in direct response to, to Craig's question, I, I don't think it's gonna be uh, a problem to add a contingent beneficiary in, in, in the event of um, a, uh, a death, for example, of, of a spousal beneficiary. Then my suggestion just to everybody that's listening is do it because the contingent beneficiary designations on most 401ks are quirky and they don't really work when your spouse predeceases you figuratively. And, and we all know that mo most clients who come in don't really know what the designations say. I mean, Larry, you probably experienced this on many of your questions and many of your clients. Well, uh, uh, to the contrary, they actually feel very confident they know what it says and then when they <laughs> check, they, they are surprised <laughs> to find out. It doesn't say what they thought. Yes. Or, or that there isn't a beneficiary designation at all. You'll be surprised that, you know, when folks initially get married, they, they don't necessarily go back to their old IRAs or their old 401k plans and change those beneficiary designations. So Although a 401k plan is automatic. If you're currently with that employer. Right. But if it's from a previous employer, a lot of folks, have, they may have their parents, they may have all different types of folks on their beneficiary designations. If I may, what, one, just one additional thought on this, which is on the contingent beneficiary, it is usually a, an, a, an income tax disaster to allow that to go to an estate. So if anyone is going to be proactive about this, they should get good tax advice and make sure that contingent beneficiary designation doesn't create a tax disaster. Yeah, the other thing to think about is it happens. People die in the middle of a divorce. And if you're in a divorce trying to keep everything from your spouse and you die and everything goes to your spouse, you'd be pretty upset if you knew that. So That so happens. We happen. We see that all the time, yeah. particularly with life insurance and 401k plans. Sometimes just the opposite happens, though, where, you, where you've changed your estate plan in the middle of a divorce and you die. Mm -hmm. And you end up with a spouse who doesn't get any divorce settlement and there's no inheritance either. Right. Uh, you're listening to Wealth Matters, where, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We're your hosts, Adam Gaslowitz and Craig Frankel, from the Fiduciary Litigation Law Firm of Gaslowitz Frankel. Today we're talking with George O'Brien, Randy Kessler, and Larry Fryman, and we're discussing estate planning issues and high-end divorces. And let's talk about the issue that Randy just raised. When you have a tentative agreement or you're working towards that through mediation or something else, and you've done some of the issues, you might have uh, d dealt with how you're going to do some of the property settlement or how you're going to provide for the children for college or whatever and you haven't finalized it and somebody dies along the way and one of the key things we see by the way is failure to fund insurance or the insurance is funded improperly what if anything do you do during that process as you reach agreement or on certain issues that can help protect either the spouses or the children it is so hard in divorce because people are angry and they don't want to sign off until everything's done. I'm not going to fund that. I'm not going to have a partial settlement because I'm only going to agree to give her this much alimony if she allows me to see the children. So we've settled alimony contingent on her being cooperative. And, and it's, it's very hard to get anything in writing. I wish I could get more temporary settlements. And, you know, it's funny I gave a lecture last night. If you get anything done, if you can get it signed off on and start implementing it, great. But that's something that maybe most divorcers need to talk to you all about and say, listen, if you can get this part of it done, move it forward because things happen, life happens, people die. Um, but it, it does not happen enough. But there are, what I would do is, I'd, again, I'd consult with you all, I'd consult with Larry and say, you know, can we start, you know, executing the documents and can we start funding now? We've got a piece of paper, even if it's a handwritten note, authorizing this part of the settlement um, that I feel will be enforceable in court. I would do that. I'd go to Larry, I'd go to somebody uh, that knows what they're doing and say, let's get those documents 
going. But normally what happens in a divorce is the divorce decree gets signed and finalized, and then there's the follow-up that needs to happen. And then people say, well, what else do I need to do? I'm emotionally beyond the divorce. Now I need to go figure out my will, my 401k, go, my take a step. Take a step back. You say after the divorce decree is signed. My experience is it takes a while for that divorce decree to be signed, even if you've reached a mediated settlement. What happens on the enforceability of that mediated settlement and all of the estate planning documents and life insurance and whatnot? Well, I mean, those are big fights, you know, because a lot of times you'll meet and mediate until 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. You have handwritten notes trying to interpret what a lawyer wrote at 3 o'clock in the morning. And people try to add things or they say that wasn't my intent. So those, I mean, the negotiations about what was settled and what was agreed on are difficult, complicated by the fact that somebody's got, you know, someone in their ear saying, how did you agree to that? You know, I had a client once tell me, you know, she was in the middle of mediation all day and her dad kept calling and she said, you know, Randy, it's like I'm in the operating room and he's in the waiting room. And, you know, everyone's second guessing. And so there's a lot of second guessing after the settlement. Um, so that does take a long time. And that's, that's the dilemma. Is someone who's contesting a settlement memo going to say, but let's go ahead and facilitate the transfer of, of assets. And they're not going to do that until they feel like they've gotten everything they want in that document. So that's that's that gray area, and that's where maybe the clients have to say to their lawyers, look, this is important. I want to make sure that my family's money that was going to be shared like this gets accomplished regardless of whether he sees the kids on Friday at 5 or Saturday morning at, at 8. Georgia, can you, is there anything you could do in advance? And I, I say something that I think I, and I already know is not legal. But could you do the equivalent of a contingent designation saying you're in a divorce, you've got your life insurance and it says every you know, life insurance goes to my spouse of $10 million and now you're in a divorce and instead say life insurance goes to my spouse $10 million but if we're divorced or if we're in the process of divorce it goes to my kids or some of it goes to my kids or something like that. Could you do pre-planning like that? You know I, I would actually ask, um, ask Larry whether or not that would be okay to do on a life insurance designation to be able to say I nominate my spouse, provided we're married. Um, you know, I, I'm not quite sure that during the actual divorce you would be able to really do anything other than add contingents behind that spouse. But, but you can do contingent designations. You can do contingent, and I think the people don't. The, the the tricky thing about something like that is whether or not the insurance company would accept the the change if it is uh, processed as, as a change. How about a, a use of a prenup that gives somebody, for lack of a word, a power or an agency to effectuate something? Because Georgia had mentioned effective on the divorce. A lot of things happen on the divorce. But we may have the process along the way, and I'm thinking about people dying during the divorce process. Could we use a prenup and have a contractual obligation that says, if we're in this circumstance, is that something we're seeing or should be seeing? Yeah, the, the only thing there I can I can add I don't I don't frankly see this a lot where uh, there is a uh, dependency of a divorce and people are trying to um, protect uh, interests and I think practical matter Randy sees this all the time and people are not just simply not going to agree in a, in a divorce situation but if there has been some mediated settlement and there is a contractual agreement there's a, a an agreement that has been reached there sh could be some some contract right that can be enforced by one or one of the spouses should something unfortunate happen in, uh, in the interim before the divorce is settled. Well, you know, you raise an interesting question, Craig, because most prenups say in the event of divorce, this is how property is going to be divided. It doesn't say in the event someone files for divorce. You know, and maybe should we be considering that? Maybe we should. Maybe that's something that maybe it's happening enough that it's something that lawyers should start thinking and about. How do you divine that? Considering divorce. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of people are well, considering you know, it for the time you could say married. filed. Filed <laughs> well, is a date, so. You know, the, the interesting issue is usually we say for divorce, get a prenup. For death, get a will. And they're two completely different concepts. But what if you're in the middle of a divorce? You know, the court is instructed to carry out the intention of this prenup should someone die before the divorce actually is concluded. That's well, an interesting and, and issue. Most, and most prenups deal with divorce and not death. Right, right. Yeah. And um, I was just going to ask you, how long does a typical divorce take? in terms of time frame? Uh, 26 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I saw, met a guy last night, he said he was from New Jersey and he's finishing his divorce three years. They've been, fin you know, so if everything's uncontested, everybody agrees, or there's not a lot to divide, it, it could be, you know, 30 days in Georgia. Wow. But that takes a lot of agreement, a lot of cooperation. We've seen them go two, three years, um, you know, depending on how complex, business valuations, but two to three years is it, and we're actually doing pretty good by national standards. I mean, California, it's five, six years. Yeah. You've got to rent a private judge. 
Um, but, you know, Fulton County moves cases along quickly. Gwinnett's a very quick moving court system. So it, I'd say the average divorce, if there is such a thing, you're lucky if you get out in less than six months. So, so how, how, do you, how do you deal with issues of, of, of complex estate planning that, that of the type Larry might do? Where there's a lot of trust involved, a lot of assets are moved into vehicles that are that are managed then by the other spouse. And so as you're going through a divorce, you've got trusts that are now controlled by the spouse you want to divorce. How do you deal with that? Either before or during the divorce? Well, let me, let me speak to it uh, after the divorce is final, because that's when I see it come up most often. Uh, first, first situation might be that these documents, many of which could be irrevocable when they were created, may already contemplate the what if uh, divorce. And uh, many times they contemplate that and say that if there's a divorce, then the spouse is considered to have predeceased and the documents are, will flow accordingly. Uh, that, that's wait, after the divorce is final. Yes. That was a question I have for you. Have you I'm sorry to interrupt you, Larry, but have you ever seen a will or created a will where it says, not just if someone's divorced, then they're considered predeceased. But how about if a divorce has been initiated, then the assets will be distributed differently? That's something that Craig's question sort of made me think of. We usually uh, deal with it in terms of either a divorce or a legal separation, but not in terms of a step back from that and uh, with something having been filed. No. It's usually if the if the divorce or the separation has been concluded. Yes, right. But in that, that's sort of an interesting thought that you all raised. What happens if because if you're going through a divorce, you obviously don't want your assets distributed the same way you probably did when you created your will. Well, well, I think the, 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 the slippery slope there is uh, people may reconcile. And if it is mm -hmm. not final and they, they do work it out before it is final, then how do you put it all back together again? You could probably write that. I have confidence in your ability. <laughs> <laughs> Adam's question was a little more directed, though. Oftentimes, the wealthier spouse will do estate planning techniques, a GST trust or a revocable trust or whatever it is, and name the spouse as the trustee, mm -hmm. but the truth is during their marriage, that spouse trustee didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Now they're nearing divorce. They might not do anything. They were basically directed by the spouse who set up the trust. It, it, it was done for planning. Now what do you do in that context? Again, usually pre-divorce, after filing, but before divorce, there's uh, little that you do in that context because uh, it's the do no harm um, situ the theory that, that I take on that. but. But post-divorce, there are some things that can happen, uh, either in terms of uh, uh, the documents uh, uh, operating the way they were uh, written, which would, in my document, typically say in the event of divorce, that spouse who was the trustee is out because just, of the divorce. Just to let you know, that's, the, that, that's typical for you and it's a very smart idea. That is not um, what I see. Right, especially on life insurance trusts. A lot of times on life insurance trusts, you have that spouse as the trustee. And, and if there's, if the attorney has, you know, not deep expertise in estate planning that drafted that life insurance trust, then some of that standard language will not remove the spouse in the event of a divorce. And we're seeing this is an area for former spouses to fight over. Mm -hmm. Control over a trust, whether it be an insurance trust or a trust for the kids, this is a way to get that final dig in. And, and I think that that really needs to be yeah. ferreted out during yeah. the divorce process. Uh, if, if identifying that issue and having the parties negotiate a way to solve that uh, in advance of the divorce, because if it is not provided for, you're dealing with a potential uh, roadblock. Randy, are you talking about that? Uh, we are, but again, you know, and not to just keep punting to Larry, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there. Are, I don't think you know, divorce lawyers. We all have our issues, and we all you know learn how to practice as we grow up in, in the law, and that's why they call it a practice. You know, we're hearing a client area that all he or she wants to talk about is what her husband did to her, or what her what her right. spouse did to him, and they're not thinking long term. So we've got to get them into the experts' hands, and and just like the folks here, just like Georgia, we need experts, forensic accountants, for instance, because the fight in a divorce is often not about how do you divide things or what percentage to get. It's more about what is there to divide, what is the asset really worth, which asset do you want, and that's not my expertise. That's y'all's expertise. I mean, go to Georgia and say. How important is this life insurance trust? How valuable is that? You know, the, the retirement account, that kind of stuff, you know, the stuff that's in the will, if I can get them to those folks, and I heard an, an accountant talk at a, a CPA seminar and, about divorce, and she said, you know, when people start thinking about the money, they're thinking about their future. And so when they're talking about trust and wills and estates and inheritance, they're thinking about how they're going to live their future life. And that's good for me and it's good for the client because they're not focusing on what he did and what she did. And so. 
you know, the more we can get those folks to look at them and put pen to paper and say, here's how you're going to look financially when this is over, I think the better for everybody. You're listening to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We're your hosts, Adam Gasolitz and Craig Frankel from the fiduciary litigation law firm of Gasolitz Frankel. We're talking to Randy Kessler, Larry Fryman, and Georgia O'Brien, and we're discussing estate planning issues and high-end divorces. Let's talk a little bit about that. So we're sitting down and you're doing early on in your, I don't know what's called, your financial disclosure. Is part of the disclosure identifying that you're a beneficiary of a trust, for example? I think you gotta just, you know, some people have no idea. In fact, I'd say most people have no idea. You know, most people say, call Larry, or call my accountant, or call somebody that, or let me go to my safe deposit box. But, you know, our job is to get them to produce the documents, bring the documents out, you know, let's look at them, let's see what there is to divide. You know, some people, though, put their head in the sand, and they want out at all costs. And, and that's when we're in a dangerous position as lawyers. You know, how do you let somebody settle? You know, the truth of the matter is we get um, complained about because we drag cases on. We push people not to settle because we want to make a lot of money. That's the image that a lot of lawyers have. So there's a balance between letting them settle and making sure they know everything. If this well, was mostly we're trying to protect our clients from themselves sometimes. They're, that, they're anxious to get out. We're trying to make sure that they get what they're entitled to. And we kind of need to give them the comfort that, that we're going to get them both. We're going to right. get them out and we're going to get them what they're entitled to. And as soon as you feel that way, there's the opposite side. that you know We're trying to say don't fight so hard because you're going to spend $50,000 in lawyer fees to get a $10,000 benefit. So yeah, there's a balance, but um, the bottom line is if you don't understand the, the numbers and the, and the documents, find someone that does. A lot of people have good accounts, and a lot of times they don't want to use their husband's accountant because they're on the same team. But the truth is that person knows more about it, and that person's got a duty and an ethical obligation, and very, very few accounts I've found are going to sell their soul to protect a wealthy client because they're not making all their money on one client. Well, let, let's talk about the wealthy client. I was thinking... Um, as we were getting ready for this, the name of the show is, you know, divorces and high-end divorces. So we're talking about wealthier clients. And a wealthier client may be a beneficiary of a trust and it may affect child support. Do you, or should you, when you're considering what property settlements are or child support should be or alimony, should we be looking at what a benefit might be under a trust or some other outside vehicle that may not be earned money or income? Yeah, we look at resources, we look at ability to pay, but the truth of the matter is, I mean, even though we deal with a lot of high-end clients, people that have a lot of money, the average court is looking, you know, half of all divorce cases can't afford lawyers. So those folks don't even have enough money to hire a lawyer, and, ha and the other half, very few have the kind of assets we're talking about today. So judges are not going to be real sympathetic when you say, look, he's got a million dollars in a trust. They want to know how much money does it take to raise this child. I just gave the last three ladies that came in $300 each, and you want $10,000. It's very hard to get much beyond that. I would much rather be creative with you all and come up with a way to fund the child's future, fund college, fund um, a trust for the child, instead of saying, I need to know how, much m how many assets you have to try to generate a little bit higher child support. That's just an up, up, uphill battle. So, so what you're saying is what, what Georgia mentioned to me prior to the show, her magic word that she used, and I'll put it in her mouth, is pre-funding. So explain to That's me how you could use that. Well, there, especially with wealthy families, uh, sometimes you end up having quite a lot of money in trust from different grandparents that have set it aside in a generation skipping trust for that child's benefit and so the discussion isn't so much you know funding the college education or other endeavors that as that as that child gets older that they may engage in it's more you know what is it going to take to what is it going to take to provide for that child till their age of majority? And that I would really, you know, pre-funding that, like you're saying, and making sure that that gets done in the event of a death by the parent is, is a key point. And so even though there's these resources that, that might be available to the family and to that child through other family members, you know, my guess is a lot of times that isn't looked at at all during a divorce. Well, there are a thousand ways. I mean, grandma and grandma can pay for, you know, the, the school or the high school or the private school. You can buy a house for a child and you can name, title the house however you want um, and transfer it to the child at age 18. That way, instead of giving the custodial parent, mom or dad, money to pay rent, you can say, you will not have rent or mortgage because you will have a house. Um, a lot of high profile folks do that. I'm going to buy a house for her. That way I know my kids are going to be in the same neighborhood as I am. 
Um, we represented a guy named Travis Henry who was in the NFL and had, fell on hard times. He had a lot of children and a lot of income early in his life. And the Supreme Court approved the idea that a court could order a trust, or, you know, so that if he didn't pay child support, there was a few hundred thousand dollars sitting there. And, you know, I think it's unique to those facts because he was the kind of guy that was not going to keep earning millions of dollars a year. But in those unique facts, you can set up trusts that are specifically for child support or for housing for a child or for schooling for a child. Well, what about trust? What about trust we set up um, as part of the divorce settlement where we're, we're creating a, a life insurance policy for the benefit of children in case uh, you know the parent dies and can't keep making child support payments? That's almost a given now. You know, when I start, how do you make sure those are actually carried out? Well, well, the first thing is now you can get a court order, you know, and the court can actually order it, which makes it easy to settle on that when someone says, I'm not going to do that because the court can't make me. You know, we used to say, well, it's good for the kids, and they say, well, I know that, but I'm going to extract some concessions, and you fight with your clients about that. Um, but how do you make sure it's funded? You've got to have follow-up, and the problem, again, is in divorce. What happens when the divorce is over? Do people want to come back and see me and keep talking about this <laughs> stuff? You know, they don't. No. Do they want to change their beneficiaries? Do they want to go through and look at their will documents? They want to you know, go either to spend six months in therapy or go to the Bahamas or do something to put this out of their mind. But that's the problem. That's where the people that are going to be long term with them, the, the estate planners and the, and the accountants and the financial planners have to meet with them and say, listen, now's the time to really get back on track. You're starting over. Yeah, but a lot of the divorce settlements we see the results of will require the uh, divorcing parent to, to uh, keep a life insurance policy and name a, the child or children as beneficiaries. But that's the extent of it. So you've got a, a contract, a divorce settlement that acquire, requires it, but you get to the end of that person's life and there's no life insurance policy. Or well, the policy has been designated to his new spouse and not to his children. It's hard to enforce those after the fact. Yeah, and you got the court of equity saying this is what should have happened versus this is what did happen. And, you know, sometimes you get a judge that's going to say, I'm going to figure it out for them as if they'd done the right thing. And, you know. But is, there, is there a way to do the right thing in advance? Is there a way to structure as part of the divorce settlement something that is that doesn't require you to reinforce it down the road. I mean, you can put penalties for not doing it. You can, you know, obviously it's contempt of court if you don't and do it. But life insurance, they, they do have irrevocable designations in terms of beneficiaries. So the, the issue is paying for the premiums. Well, sure, right. Well, you can do it all. You can put it all in the divorce settlement. You can put everything in there because that is a contract. It is a court order. And, you know, the problem is then you've got clerks and you've got people that don't recognize that. You could say, Wife transfers the home to husband, and that's an effective transfer. It's a court order. But the clerk and the title examiner is not going to see that and think, hey, that's the same as a limited warranty deed. I mean, you've got to follow through and do the paperwork. But, you know, a settlement agreement evidences the intent of the parties, and the courts are supposed to help people carry out their intent. It's just On houses, you can see it because you can go down and check and say, gosh, did it get recorded right? On life insurance and other issues that deal that are triggered by death, you're not going to know till they die. And one of the problems we're seeing is that you can enforce it for breach of contract, absolutely, but it's a breach of contract against the now deceased spouse of the state. And, and, and sometimes the estate doesn't have the money. Especially when the life insurance is paid directly to a beneficiary, an inv individual beneficiary. That, uh, Correct. And that individual beneficiary does not often, it's typically the second spouse or third or fourth, typically does not say, gosh, I'd like to give this right. to the other person. So you're stuck with a contractual remedy. Right, right. and the insurance company is not going to help you out because insurance they're company only can't. going to honor whoever is on that beneficiary designation form and nothing else. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask a funny question. So, so, so we, we've talked about one situation. Each of you, give us an example of, of, a, of a, whether it's by agreement or by divorce decree, where something came up afterwards that you wish you had been able to anticipate or solve but couldn't, and as they died or later happened, it kind of fell apart. And I'm going to give us a two-part question. Give me an example of where it went wrong, and then I want you to give me an example where you were able to think about it and it went right. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in um, with uh, this kind of same line of, of discussion, which is where a, the parties agree in a, a, a divorce settlement to uh, establish a trust for child support uh, with life insurance funding that trust. I, I would say nine out of ten times I see clients that have been divorced and they show me the divorce uh, uh, settlement uh, and we, I say, okay, let me see this trust. There's no trust to be produced. And I think part of the problem is a um, the clients uh, simply don't understand when they go through a divorce that this is a um, there's an implementation item there. They may have been told that, 
but they don't uh, appreciate that. They, you know, they have burnout or whatever it is. So a real critical piece is not implemented. So um, the, I guess the war story is that uh, you, you see that pretty often, which is that uh, there's the, um, uh, the life insurance exists, the wrong beneficiary is named, uh, uh, wrong person is named as beneficiary, and the, and the, uh, the intent is not, is not there to be carried out. Um, most most uh, divorced spouses say the last thing they want is for their ex-spouse to be in control of the funds that they get there, and they have done nothing to, um, uh, to address that because they haven't implemented the trust. So where you can get it done right is in the process of a divorce is actually have that trust prior to the party's uh, final settlement agreement and decree and walking away. You actually have that trust uh, uh, created as part of the process and executed with the divorce settlement agreement. Uh, and uh, the parties walk away with that piece having been resolved. So you're suggesting really that the divorce, the, the settlement agreement that will be incorporated into the divorce decree attach the critical estate planning documents which forces them pre-walk away to the Bahamas? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Look, I mean, their whole host... Ideally, Craig, yeah. I mean, Craig, your examples, there are a whole host of problems. Number one, right, if someone dies, you know, if someone tries to sell a house and then the deed wasn't recorded, you can go back and get them to execute the deed. If they die, you can't go back and get them to execute it. But the problem is post-divorce, when you find the problem that somebody has not executed the document, you've got people that are angry. I don't like the way it ended. I'm not going to sign that. You know, put me in jail. I don't care. But she's not going to, you know, get on that note or whatever it is. Um, to answer Adam's question, you know, we're all talking about an ounce of prevention, and obviously an ounce of prevention I is good. Things that have happened in the past, there's, you know, a simple example is if you're married 10 years, you get, you know, to share in the Social Security benefits. We've seen people get a divorce December 29th where if they'd waited till you know January 1st or not being able to file joint tax returns because they were divorced at the end of the year you know simple things like that that people just are in such a hurry to get closure they feel like I'm putting this behind me that even with good advice they won't go through and go meet with another lawyer and they're out of money um, but other examples that I've seen are people are supposed to change the beneficiary of their retirement or whatever it is and they get married to somebody else and then they die and that somebody else expects to be the beneficiary and they're not because the first person who was despised by the deceased is still <laughs> on the documents. I mean, yeah. it's just follow through. I no, 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 you're supposed to finish off with, I'm sorry, you're supposed to finish off where it went well. So tell us a one of the times where you tried, it succeeded. Oh, every one of our cases. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia? I, I was gonna say, you know, there's, uh, they settle on their divorce, but they were supposed to uh, sell the house. The house may be a very large asset, and they expect the house is going to be worth X, except the house isn't worth X, it's, min it's X minus minus, and now all of a sudden the fact pattern has completely changed, and they're back to, you know, the, the starting line with trying to renegotiate all, everything based on very different values that that they actually received on the sale of a house versus what they thought at the bargaining there's, table. There's a great one along those lines, which is there's a two hundred fifty thousand dollar exemption right on capital gains. If you sell a house and if you're married, there's five hundred thousand. But a lot of people will transfer their interest in the house to their spouse, and then there's a four hundred thousand dollar gain, and they can only exclude two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Had they sold it while it was still jointly titled they'd be tax-free. See, you just solved someone's brilliant problem. You just saved them a couple hundred thousand in tax. I hope so. Larry, I have a funny question for you, only because it, 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 it was interesting to me. So you're saying in estate planning, someone comes to you, they've already, husband and wife, worked together to do their estate plan, and now they're getting a divorce. And they come to you and say, gosh, I want a divorce. Are you obligated to tell the other spouse? If one one of the spouses comes to me with that uh, with that information. Um, I I don't believe I'm obligated to tell the other spouse at that point uh, what the uh, what 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 he or she is thinking. Um, but if they have uh, told me that they've taken action that is um, adverse to my other client, because typically I have two clients in that situation, and I have a duty to both clients. If I know that there's been some action taken to the, um, or being asked to take action, uh, then uh, I do get into that that gray area where I may need to notify my other client, the, the spouse, about that. Or you may just need to withdraw from representing one, and they may guess why or not, right? That's right. That's right. 
and we establish kind of that that uh, the rules of the game when we when we are initially engaged with with a married couple on estate planning. We talk about those issues and, and what what were what would happen uh, theoretically in the event of a, a divorce. Do you wish people would do you wish people would come to you when they were starting a divorce instead of afterwards? Like if I, if a client came in to see me and they had all sorts of estate issues, how much easier would it be for them if they met with you? Before the divorce was finished and we got this stuff into the settlement agreement? Yeah, potentially a, a huge difference for that client, uh, particularly for those things that they can make, uh, they, they can make changes to with, uh, with an agreement uh, through a settlement agreement as opposed to, as you alluded to, after uh, the parties are divorced and trying to get agreement at that point is, uh, is very challenging. I think we're actually uh, uh, getting towards the end of our time, so before we go, um, I'm going to ask each of you to remind us who you are and tell us if any of our listeners want to call you. And if I understand correctly, they need to call all three of you. So <laughs> at the same time, because if they're doing it right, if they're going to think about a divorce, they're going to call Randy. But they're going to want to talk to Georgia about how to make sure their assets are right. And they're going to want to talk to Larry about how to make sure or think about their estate planning. All done, according to Larry, prior to the settlement agreement and decree. So Georgia, we'll start with you. To contact me, uh, you can either email me, Georgia, at trustffm.com, or you can call us at 404-850-7930. Uh, I can be reached at uh, phone number 770-379-1450. Email address is lfryman, L-F-R-E-I. It's E before I, M-A-N, <laughs> at MendonFryman.com. Uh, and I'm Randy Kessler, and you can find me at uh, KS Family Law. It's like King Solomon, KSFamilyLaw.com. Um, or or DivorceProtect.com is the website for the book, which is a real basic overview, and I'm plugging it. We don't make a lot of money on it, but it, <laughs> I wish every client would read that before they'd come to see me because it'd save a lot of time. It talks about, you know, how do courts decide this and that, and how do you hire a lawyer, so... Uh, KS Family Law or DivorceProtect.com and uh, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. All right. As we're wrapping up our show, I want to thank everyone who's been listening to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. Remember to follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute and use our show's hashtag Wealth Matters. Our guests today were Randy Kessler, Georgia O'Brien, and Larry Fryman. And please join us every fourth Wednesday of the month, 830, here on Wealth Matters on Business Radio X. <laughs>